Susan Zink with Montessori for Everybody TV. If you've watched any of our previous episodes, you've heard me talk about children and talk about children and talk about children because that is mostly what uh, Montessori is about. It's about setting up environments that allow children to learn, um, allow them to be treated with respect in a home or a school environment, and about education. That's what Montessori is about. But I'm going to suggest to you that Montessori is about something much more. Montessori is about a way of being in community with children and a way of being in community with children that supports not only the well-being of those children, but the adults in that community as well. There are several ways that I believe that this is the case. One of them has to do with a way that children have of enriching us. Dr. Montessori talks about the child teaching us the true nature of love, and I believe that's absolutely true. I believe that when you set up a way of interacting with children that truly respects their own beingness, their completeness as a human being, even though it is an immature human being, when you interact with a child in that way, those children will show you love and be an example of love that most of us can't even imagine. This is one of the ways that the children serve their community. There is another way that I think that doing Montessori education with children will improve your life as an adult, which is if you aspire to treat children with absolute respect, and if you have any understanding of behavior modification, of, of the, the way that um, people shape their own behavior and that their behavior is shaped by the influence of others, you know that the only way to treat children with respect is to learn to act with respect yourself. They will need to see you acting with respect to other people. And this includes um, tough love respect as well. If you are treating a child with respect, you don't accidentally validate behavior in them that isn't serving them. If you are working in a group of children and you have set up the procedure that one must raise their hand or one must wait for a gap in the conversation and not talk over others, if a child then forgets or has not yet learned that skill and talks over another child, the way that we um, model appropriate behavior is we don't respond. We treat this as something that someone needs to rethink. It's not that we ignore that child or we don't go back to them and interact with them. We give them a chance to notice, why didn't that adult respond to me? Oh, I talked over someone. There's a lot of times that I see, particularly in American culture, where parents are so intent on making sure that every interaction they have with their child is positive and everything that the child could possibly want happens in life that they mistakenly affirm behaviors that aren't going to serve the child. And the reason I put it that way is it's not just a behavior that's irritating to the parent, but it's a behavior that will really make the child less well accepted in his or her peer group, in a community of adults and children. So when you act with wisdom toward children, you are supporting your entire community and you are learning to act with respect toward the adults in your community as well. So I believe that if we're going to do Montessori, we do need to do it as a community. I've seen things that some schools have written up that, that address all the different adults that interact with the children within the school community. So they may have notes for classroom assistants, maybe if there are people who do a separate food preparation program or bus drivers or crossing um, guards um, who help the children cross the street. They, they reach out to these people and help them understand a Montessori way of interacting with children. Well, I'm going to suggest that this is education. This is guidelines that need to be shared with our entire community. And I'm going to suggest that if we as an entire community of adults are not treating all children with respect, we've missed the boat. We have chosen not to live 
a standard that most of us really do believe. And the reason that the television show is called Montessori for Everybody is because I really believe that. I believe Montessori is for everybody. I believe there will come a time when there will be people who will look at a photograph of children sitting in rows in desks, looking at a teacher at the front of the room, and they will just think, oh my goodness, how on earth could they do that? They will look at that photograph the way we look at photographs of children working in mines. They will look at that photograph the way we look at children sitting in poverty on the streets of a big city at the end of the 1800s. Those are the ways we will look at those photos when we really understand how cruel it is to impose education on children rather than letting children educate themselves in a respectful way. Now I know that's radical and I know there's a lot of people who say, oh, there's different methods that are good for every child. Well, I'm not saying every child needs the pink tower. If you've ever seen a photo of a Montessori classroom for children ages three to six, you've probably seen a pink tower. I think every child age three to six can benefit from a pink tower pretty much if they are developmentally um, within those ages three, three to six, whether that's their actual age or not. But I don't think that's what absolutely has to happen. What absolutely has to happen for us to treat children with respect is we need to understand the nature of the child the way that Dr. Montessori did. We don't have to do everything she did, but we need to understand most of what she understood. If we're going to make changes in our community, that has to take place. And I'm going to suggest that if you're already mostly on the same page that I'm speaking from in this episode, that you may need to speak up. You may need to talk to people the way I'm talking to you and say, hey, it's not okay to force your will on children. It's not okay to make them sit when they need to move. It's not okay to make them sit and stare at an adult for hours a day. That's not okay. And I'm finally going to suggest that one of the reasons that Montessori education can serve all of the adults in the community is because we need to find a way to have parents have saner lives. We need to find a way to first educate those parents about what needs to happen. They need to understand that a young child, a very young child, has to have support to learn skills like soothing him or herself as well as skills like using the toilet independently. A very young child needs to learn how to work around in the community and to do things like putting on shoes and putting on clothes and that the earlier those children do that, the happier they are. And that is a cycle of saner parents. The more that you do for your child, the more likely you are to be tired. The more that your child does for him or herself that's developmentally appropriate, the happier everybody is. The child is happy to do those things. The child is happy to be independent and you will be happier with less responsibilities on your plate. Now, does that mean that the child just is free to do what he or she wants? Absolutely not. And is it easy to do this way of Montessori parenting at the very beginning? No, particularly since you're probably gonna have to shift some attitudes, which is not an easy thing to do, but it's possible. And once you've done that, once you have interacted with that child in a way that is completely respectful, in a way that is supporting independence at every turn, you will find that life in your home, in your community gets easier and easier. And the last way that I believe Montessori education is essential to supporting the life of the adults in the community that are parents is that we have to have a way to let parents do their work in a way that does not exhaust them. We have to have times that children are separate from their parents who have work that is not related to the child in a way that serves everyone. Those children need to be able to go to an environment that feeds their souls. They need to come home rested and happy and having acted with respect toward other children and fulfilled their own needs while they are away from their parents who are working at other things. We need to have work for parents who want to work with children that is sane. 
we have to have them working in an environment where they can work a day that is reasonable and then go home to their own families and have a family life. This is the promise of Montessori education as well from my perspective. If we're doing it right, if we're doing it appropriately, we can shape Montessori schools, including schools for very young children, in a way that parents will be happy to bring their children there if work with children is not their path, to go to their own work and come back and pick up those happy children. Also, we need to find ways for parents to live and work in sane ways. If a mother has a two-year-old child and wants to return to work that is outside of working with children. We need to have a way for her to take her child to a place where that child will be well cared for while she goes to work and not for the whole day. Maybe it's the father that's going to do that. Maybe it's the father who is going to be the primary caregiver for that child outside of his part-time work day. We have to create those new structures. We have to create a community where people can do their work and live their lives and take their rest and take their recreation in a way that serves everyone. We can't have parents working a 40-hour workday and then attempting to take care of their children after both of them have worked a 40-hour workday and just continue a cycle of exhaustion. And here's the real problem. Most of the parents I know, even before their time with their children, aren't working a 40-hour workday. They're working a 50-hour workday. Or maybe they're working two or three jobs. Those things have to change. If we're going to be healthy as a community, we have to find a way to treat all community members with respect. And an essential part of that is honoring their work. We must honor the work of the two-year-old child to learn to separate from mother, to learn to put on shoes and take off shoes, to learn to settle his or her own emotions at least a little bit without the help of an adult. We must honor the work of parents who need to have energy left when they go home and be with their families. Until we honor the deep, important work of every human being in our community, we will never have the communities that we want. And we can. It's possible. But we have to work together to figure out how to do it. And I believe Dr. Montessori had a lot of the solutions that will allow that to happen. I'm Susan Zink with Montessori for Everybody TV, and we have just finished our 50th episode. I want to tell you about a little guide that I have put together to help you make the most of the episodes that we've done so far. Our episode guide for the first 50 will give you the titles of all of the different episodes, but much more importantly, it will help you to explore where you need to to improve your Montessori practice. If you have been running into problems, if you feel like maybe you have a complete Montessori training, you've had a school for a while, or you've been doing Montessori in your home for a few years, and things just aren't working the way you hear other people talking about, maybe you are brand new to Montessori education, but you've heard all these things that kind of concern you. It's hard and you put in all this work and then it doesn't work. Or maybe you just want to do it the best that you can. This guide will give you some different ways to approach how to learn to do that. One is our set of potential pitfalls. Montessori education is simple in many ways, but it is also complex in many ways. Setting up the environment, what you need to do to prepare as an adult, the, the shifts that you need to make from the common ways of looking at children in most cultures to a Montessori filter of how you look at your child. These all are places where there are places that's really easy to make mistakes. Also, Montessori is about stuff. <laughs> if you're going to prepare an environment, you're going to put a lot of objects around, especially in a Montessori classroom, but even in a Montessori home. And stuff can be expensive, stuff can get cluttered, stuff can be hard to take care of, and it's really easy to end up with a lot of Montessori stuff 
that isn't really helping you to do Montessori practice. So we help you with those pitfalls as well. And this guide will give you a chance to quickly review what you're already doing in Montessori or what you're thinking about doing and how you can go about it. The, another thing that we've put in the guide are some printables that will help you. If you have watched some of our episodes, you know that I say a lot of times if it's not on your shelves, it ends up not happening because as Montessorians, especially in the Montessori classroom, we come, become kind of oriented to the things on our shelves. So I've put together a, sen a set of grace and courtesy cards so that if you're not teaching all the grace and courtesy exercises that you'd like to, all those grace and courtesy skills, these cards on your shelf um, will help you to, to do that and to have that reminder. If you've watched any of our phonics episodes, you know I have a little different approach to phonics and I am not a fan of puzzle words or secret words. Different people um, call, them, call them different things. I'm a big fan of secrets. That's little folded pieces of paper that the, the children open and read the word. But puzzle words or treating words like you can't sound them out, I'm not for that. So I put my little keywords handouts that I have. It's two cards. That's all that you need for the most part to get help those children be able to decode those words that are a little trickier to decode and start in reading with phonetic readers. So one of the things you may notice already, if this is the first time you've heard me, is I'm about the essentials. I'm about what's going to make it happen for you and what you absolutely need to be successful. Now, you could spend thousands of dollars on a single Montessori classroom with good effect and have an amazing classroom that functioned beautifully. Sadly, you could also spend thousands of dollars on a Montessori classroom and have it not function as a Montessori classroom at all. So I'm going to encourage you to invest in yourself find ways to become complete in your own understanding of Montessori education. Because if you don't understand the child and how to look at the child from a Montessori point of view, if you don't understand how to transform yourself into a Montessori education, excuse me, into a Montessori educator, you can't do Montessori, either in your home or in a school. So I hope that you will um, sign up on our website. That's all that you have to do to get this episode guide. It's, it's completely free of charge. And then it will allow you to make the best use of that resource that we've already put online free for you, the Montessori for Everybody TV show, our first 50 episodes. In this segment, we're going to focus on building community. Now, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about certainly apply to younger children, but the specific focus is going to be children ages 6 to 12 and even older, particularly if you are working with adolescents who have not been treated with respect in the past, who are perhaps newer to Montessori or brand new to Montessori and, and are still really getting their feet under them in terms of acting in a respectful classroom where a lot of freedom is, is permitted. So the reason that I say building community is that is definitely the focus that I have when I'm working with older children. If you're working with younger children, I don't say we manage children. We manage a classroom. So we manage the materials in the classroom, our records, our paper things, but we lead children. So I talk about classroom leadership in the younger classroom. In the older children's classroom, it's building community. And more and more and more of the leadership needs to come from the children. So building community is one of the most important things that you can do at the beginning of the year. Now, involved with that are some management skills. And so some of the specific objects I'm going to show you and talk about are about managing your environment so that your group can work in community most effectively. But any of the social pieces are about creating community, helping every single child in your class feel that he or she belongs. He or she not only belongs, he or she is an essential, loved, wanted partner in creating what all of you are doing together. So one of the things I found is that for things that are 
really, really important, you almost have to go to metaphors. It's just not possible to talk about them in a concrete fashion because they are abstract by their nature. And one of the beauties of Montessori education is that many of the, the gifts that Dr. Montessori and uh, Mario Montessori gave us were metaphors to help children understand things that are by nature abstract. The, the golden beads are a metaphor for the decimal system. The decimal system is an abstract idea made concrete through the golden beads. So some of the things I'm going to talk about in this segment are making concrete those abstract things that are essential to a good community working together. And many of them, most of them, maybe all of them, are, are not anything that I've put together. It's just things that I've gathered together that support community. Now, if you're closer to my age than, than the age of the folks I was teaching with most recently, you may recognize this book. Um, this is the original Warm Fuzzy Tale. It's a part of the transactional analysis community, and it has to do with helping children realize when they are improving their relationship with others and when they're detracting from their relationship with others. It helps them to take an observer position. And so rather than just saying, I hate you, and just letting that be out there and doing all the damage it can do in the community, it helps them, usually in retrospect at the beginning, to look at what happened when they told someone they hated them. To notice that when you say, I hate you to someone, you're hurting them. You're creating uh, a cold prickly. <laughs> and, and that is something that, that is a negative in the environment. But also, it helps them to actually get pretty nuanced with that. If the child says, well, aren't you smart? That is really a cold prickly because on the surface, for someone who's still new with, with the nuances of language and social relationships, aren't you smart could seem like it's a positive, but it's not at all. It's, it's, a, it's a, um, a compliment that has been made cold and prickly. It's no longer what the words originally were intended to be. And that's kind of what this tale goes through. And what I do is I actually read the book, usually in a couple of sittings, depending on the, the age of the community. And then at the end of the day, after I've read the book, the, the, finished the book, um, then I have just little puff balls from the craft store in my little bag, and I hand out warm fuzzies to my children to, to take home with them. And this is a really good one to do in those first couple of weeks of school, especially if you happen to um, have a lot of children that are brand new to your class. It's something that they can then talk to their parents about, and it can be a really, really nice um, piece all the way around. Now, another um, one of these kind of metaphors, so obviously the, the warm fuzzies are metaphors for um, interactions that, that build relationship, that bring people closer together, and that make the individual who's receiving the warm fuzzy feel better about himself or, himself or herself. And the cold pricklies are something that serves in the opposite way, but specifically they are things that kind of seem designed uh, or seem um, disguised as a, a, a positive interaction, and, and they really aren't. Now, another metaphor that I, I love very much is from Sonny McFarlane. And um, Sonny has put together a, a, a little experience that, that you can, can do with the children to, to talk to them about their love lights. And, and you can think about this lots of different ways, but it's, it's kind of that sensitive part of ourselves that gets hurt when, when someone is unkind. If someone gives you a cold prickly, your love light dims a little bit. And when you talk about that story, you can actually make little love lights, just little yellow pieces of paper with a hole punch and then, then, then yarn and, and pass them out um, somewhat the way that I passed out the, the, the warm fuzzies when, when I used that metaphor. And I encourage you to look for ways to use metaphors, to use positive teaching experiences, presentations that can help the children learn to interact 
positively and, and in a peaceful and cooperative and respectful way so you're not just going after the problems. If you get stuck going after the problem, step back. Work with your community of peers. Go to the people you trust and figure out what kind of presentations or experiments or celebrations you can do to, to shift that tone. Now, one of the things that I found, particularly as our homeschool, excuse me, as well, actually as our homeschool Montessori community and our public school Montessori community has grown, that we have a lot of people doing Montessori with children who have been failed by other systems. They have been failed by the school system that they were in before or a specific teacher that they were with. Sometimes they are protecting their heart and their love light and, and attempting to, to keep themselves safe and, and sometimes they've shut down. And one of the things that I found is that teaching them overtly about things like their emotions and interacting with them on those emotions can be very useful. This is a little illustration from a book called Tribes. And the Tribes book, I, I, I got to say, I don't care for the title that much because to me, Tribes sometimes can indicate groups that are pitted against one another or that 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 have a, um, a sense of, of wholeness within themselves, but separate from others. And so I'm not big on the name tribes, but but it's about building community. It's all about building community and about building smaller communities within your classroom so that then the children can reach out to the entire community. And these are, I, I'm not sure if they're called tribbles in the book or not. I, I think that they are. I didn't look it up before we started filming. I've been calling them tribbles for so many years because that's what they look like to me. And this is a Star Trek reference if, if you're, you're not into that, just so you know. But what these are is just little creatures that are essentially their, their expressions. And it's the idea of helping children in a relatively brief set identify their state. It can be done if you have a, a meeting at the beginning of the day um, so that everybody can just say, what state are you? One, two, three, four, or five. And notice there's not even any names. There's, there can be judgment attached to things like feeling happy or sad or ambivalent or whatever. And this is a way to kind of go nonverbal with it. Most of your students are going to know the numbers one to five, and they can just kind of check in with the tribbles. You warn them ahead of time if you're going to do that. I do that by introducing this where no one has to say anything about their own state. And then I let them know that if, if when we check in in our whole group, I'm going to be asking them about their state, this will be sitting in the middle of the circle. And so it's just kind of a way for, for them to... Um, to know that I'm going to be checking in with them in that way. And that's pretty much the way that it's used in the whole group. It can be used with your children who are less verbal or even nonverbal to just kind of check in with them. So if you're not sure what's going on, if this sits on your piece or community building part of your environment on a shelf or whatever, you can go over and say, can you tell me which of these is the closest to the way you feel today? Can you point? Can you tell me the number? So that's the way that I use these. 